Hackathons can effectively make learning relatable for your team by providing an interactive and engaging learning experience. The process starts with a planning session where we identify a small to medium-sized business need for a prototype. Following a one-day training session, we collaborate with your team in a two to three-day build session where everyone is actively involved. And by the end of your hackathon, your team has developed new skills and you will have a working prototype to show for it. Hello friends and welcome. My name is Austin Leibel and we are in the Learn with the Nerds studio where we are going to be discussing data engineering in Microsoft Fabric today. I am very excited to be talking to you and to spend the next hour and a half going through a demonstration of working inside of Microsoft Fabric and working inside of the data engineering persona so that we can see some of the capabilities that Microsoft is introducing inside of the Power BI service that is going to allow data engineers, data scientists, data analysts, whatever data persona you might be to collaboratively work together in this environment. So hopefully you are excited for this as well. Now, before we go through and get started, I want to give you an introduction to some of the topics we're going to be discussing today. We won't spend too much time on that though. I wanna to get to as many demonstrations as possible and also be able to provide some good feedback with some question and answer type uh, conversations that you can have with me in the chat today. Now, what I do wanna say at the very beginning of this is this will be a recorded session of this live YouTube. So if you have to step out during any time for the next hour and a half, feel free to come back later on and you will be able to watch the entire event over and over and over again. So don't feel like you're missing out or if you can't follow along today for any reason with what I am doing, you can come back and watch again later at any time. Now, let me give you a little introduction to me, Austin Leibel, your resident Learn with the Nerds today. Uh, I will go be going through just a quick PowerPoint demonstration of talking about some of the topics we're going through, but I want to get you to know who I am a little bit more as well and why I'm here. My name is Austin. Again, I am a trainer for Pragmatic Works, and Pragmatic Works is a training company that specializes in Microsoft analytical products. So we do training on various products such as Azure, such as Power BI, the Power platform, meaning things like Power Apps and Power Automate. Since you're here on our channel, maybe you've seen some of our content before. We do lots of YouTube content. We have other kind of live training events. We have many discussions we'll have throughout the day of how we can uh, interact with the Pragmatic Works team. Now, I'm a trainer for Pragmatic Works on what we call our Azure slash data engineering team. So I've come from a background of working in tools like Synapse Analytics, Data Factory. I work with Power BI quite extensively a lot too. But I can also, if you want to reach out or connect with me or find more information about me on the web, either reach out to me via email at my email address here, which I'll share in the chat a little bit later on also, or find me on LinkedIn at my LinkedIn uh, status right there. Now, one fun fact about me is that I absolutely love to watch movies. I am a movie snob, a cinephile, if you will. So I go to the theaters all the time and watch the latest, greatest movies. Love to go through and watch movies at home and uh, at, in the theaters as well. I've also gone through and I've learned some of the uh, topics of what we're going to be discussing today when it comes to working with data lakes and uh, virtual networks and things like monitoring storage by taking one of the Microsoft certifications called the Azure Solutions Architect, which is a certification I earned by going through and taking one of those tests. I'll be talking a little bit about some of those tests a little bit later on through our class as well. Well, enough about me. This is not the Learn with the Nerd session for Austin Libel. This is about data engineering in Microsoft Fabric. Now, one of the questions you might be having at the very beginning of all this is, Austin, what even is Microsoft Fabric? I've heard of it before, but I don't really have a great understanding. Well, let me let you know that we have already done a couple of Learn with the Nerd sessions, and maybe you've seen those before, and if you have, Welcome back, but if not, I want to do a brief overview of why Microsoft Fabric exists and why it is the newest, latest, greatest, and hottest topic coming out of Microsoft in 2023. So Microsoft Fabric is an all-in-one analytical solution for enterprises that covers everything from data movement to data science, real-time analytics, and business intelligence. It offers a comprehensive suite of different services, including data lake storage, data engineering uh, with Spark capabilities, 
capabilities and data integration all inside of one place. Now with Fabric, you don't have to go through and piece together various services for multiple vendors. You can integrate all of these different services with an end-to-end -end analytical solution with an easy to use product that gives uh, anyone who is familiar with the Power BI service the ability to go in and work with some of these new technologies or done for you done potentially in other sources, but all integrated together now in one environment. So Microsoft Fabric offers this comprehensive suite of different topics like working with data warehouses or lake houses, which we'll be discussing as we go throughout the day, working with business intelligence and using Power BI reports and models to be able to go through and visualize and better understand our data, and also being able to store the data directly directly in what we call the one lake, which we'll talk about a little bit more as well. Now, one of the other questions you might have is, Austin, what is data engineering? I've heard of it before. I work in data, but I'm no near like an engineer. I think like uh, going through and working on like buildings with engineering, but data engineering is a little bit different. It's like this behind the scenes magic that makes all of the data work together. It's the process of designing, of building, and ultimately managing the architecture of a data system, including the structure and the organization. I told you I like movies, and if maybe you saw my uh, preview for this, so I talked about this there as well, but let's make a movie analogy to data engineering. So picture it like a film director, someone who is responsible for going through and getting a film and get orchestrating all these different people, production companies, uh, actors, uh, sound editing, all these different kind of things. They're wanting to go through and carefully plan each scene, select the right actors, design the overall structure of the movie. That's a little bit like data engineering, orchestrating this behind the scenes work to ensure that data is well prepared and is starring role in the analysis process. Now, this is going to involve different tasks like collecting, storing, and also processing data so that it's easily accessible, usable downstream for consumption in things like a Power BI report. So data engineers will set up the infrastructure. They will create data pipelines, which we're gonna be going through as well. They're gonna be going through and having uh, some sort of data transformation as well. So using different tools for transformation and ultimately ensuring that data is clean, organized, and ready for analysis for business intelligence analysts. So data integration workload inside of Fabric is going to provide data engineers with an ability to go through and unify hybrid or multi-cloud estates in an experience that combines the ease and use of Power Query Editor in the Power BI desktop tool with the scale and the power of Data Factory to be able to integrate and orchestrate all of your data movement, whether you're connecting on-premises, in the cloud or to third party sources. So inside of the data engineering persona as a part of the Microsoft Fabric environment, you're gonna have a couple different technologies that you can work with. One of those that we're going to be focusing on heavily for this demonstration in a little bit is going to be data pipelines and working with data factory to be able to build pipelines so that we can orchestrate data and have that run on a schedule. Now you can also go through and use tools like a Dataflow Gen 2 which is essentially Power Query Editor inside of the Power BI service so that anyone can go through and make transformations to their data as long as you have that familiarity of working in Power BI Desktop to go through and clean and modify and get, transform your data so that it looks in the fashion that you are wanting to for analysis. Now, we're also going to be using different technologies like a lake house. We'll talk about a lake house in just a moment. A lake house is where we're going to store and access our data inside of Fabric. There are a couple different uh, offerings for where we can access our data, but ultimately it's all going to be stored in the lake house as the kind of orchestrating and the main focus of where you can go through and work inside of Fabric environments. Now there's other technologies called like Spark, and we'll be talking about Spark towards the end of our course today and using some different languages like Python and SQL to be able to access data across millions of records and do so very efficiently and very quickly. Now, there is this conversation that goes along with Fabric as well. As I've seen, I keep hearing people talk about the lake house. What is the lake house? Well, the lake house is going to be this combination of the data warehouse, which is a centralized repository where you store data in structured forms from various sources, typically for the purposes of business intelligence and reporting, along with a data lake. A data lake is another repository allowing organizations 
to store different types of data, whether it be structured, so you can go through and store like tables, semi-structured with CSV files, Parquet files, or unstructured data as well. So this architecture allows you to store a large amount of data for a very inexpensive bill compared to some other sources. So data lakes are becoming very popular in data organizations because they can go through and store all of their data without necessarily having to rack up a very large Azure bill. Now, when we go through and talk about the lake house, essentially we're going to be storing our data on a data lake, but having a structure of your traditional data warehouse where you can go through and write SQL operations against that and have a confirmed ACID property, meaning you have an ability to go in and make sure your transactions and your data is going to be reliable. Now, the data lake and the one lake, which we're going to talk about in a moment here as we go through, is going to be something like a OneDrive for your organizational data. You can think as this lake as your organization goes through and wants to access and store their data in a single location so that all of the different jobs that you're performing can operate against a single source of truth instead of all these different versions of the truth that you could potentially have when you start storing your data and trying to access it across the organization organization for many different people in many different places. So using the data lake or the Microsoft Fabric One Lake, which allows you to go through and store one copy of your organizational data inside of a storage account, which you can think of like your OneDrive, but it's for access inside of the Power BI service. All right. Now, before we go through and start getting too far away, I have an exciting topic I want to bring up for a moment here. I mentioned earlier that I have that Microsoft Azure Solutions Architect certification. Anyone in here, put in the chat. You got a certification. Let me know if you have any certifications, whether it's the Power BI Data Analyst or some of the other ones. Tell me what kind of certifications you have. I'm interested. Now, Pragmatic Works is always coming up with nice, cool, new ways to be able to go through and make learning enjoyable, make the learning experience nice. So what we've done recently is we've gone through and we come up with an awesome offering to be able to go through and study for these Microsoft certification tests. And you're going to be able to give you a sneak peek today into the brand new offering for Pragmatic Works. It's going to change the way that you prepare for Microsoft certifications. Let's go ahead and let's see that video now. The Pragmatic Works team is excited to introduce Cert XP. Cert XP is not just a learning platform. It's a new horizon in technical exam preparation. Experience learning like never before, with elements of gameplay that make studying not just effective, but incredibly engaging. With our preloaded journeys, you can easily navigate through the vast array of certification options and choose the ones that align with your career goals. Cert XP will be in beta to our Season Learning Pass subscribers in December. We hope to give access to all subscribers in the new year. Stay ahead of the curve with CERT XP's exceptional training programs. Join the waitlist to be notified when CERT XP is available. Wow, that is awesome. I am so excited for that and excited for you to go through and ultimately experience this. So definitely go through and look at signing up. I will show you how to do and get on the wait list for that in uh, a few minutes as we go throughout our session today. But before we get going too far, I think it's time to go ahead and start working through some of the demonstrations that we're going to use today to be able to display data engineering inside of Microsoft Fabric. So if you would like to follow along with me, which is not a requirement, but will be in availability should you wish to go and do that you would make sure you downloaded those class files there's something you're going to need in there a little bit later on and then you can go through and join me inside of the power bi service where we're going to be going through and working through some examples of data engineering in fabric together now here is my power bi service and you can go to either app.powerbi.com or just powerbi.com to be able to access this. Now, if you're looking to follow along with me, you are going to be able to have to go through and provision a fabric enabled workspace. So if you look in the, I don't really know if I have that ability or not, I'll show you in a moment as you can go through and uh, look and see where I'm going to find that option available to me. Uh, and if you don't can, and can't follow along right now, again, this will be recorded. So you have an ability to go back and watch it later on, 
when you do have that provision for yourself. So inside of the Power BI service, there has been a big facelift over the last six to nine months. As we've gone through and seen things like integrating over here on the left-hand side, our navigational pane and some of the new different offerings that we see there. Now down here in the bottom of my screen, you will see an option called Power BI. And if I click on this, this allows me to go through and experience the persona switcher inside of the Power BI service, where I can go through and see all of the different personas that Microsoft Fabric enables for organizations to go in and act as this persona. Now, just because you work in Power BI does not mean you can't necessarily go and access the data factory persona. It's really enabled for everyone so that you can go through and learn something new and be able to help your data team help. Now, where I'm going to mainly be working inside of today is this data engineering persona. So by switching to that, I have an ability now to go through and look at all the different data engineering items that I can potentially create for myself as a part of this fabric uh, environment. Now, what I want to do first before I do any of that is go over and create a fabric enabled workspace. So I'm going to click over here on my workspace tab on the left hand side of my screen, and I'm going to go down to the bottom of all of my available workspaces and create a new workspace. Now, this is going to open up a flyout on the right hand side of my pane where I need to go and give this workspace a name. So I'm going to call this something very simple, like learn with the nerds, LWTN. And uh, I'm going to call this my data engineering. That's the session we're going through today. If you want to know more about what does Power BI mean for the, uh, what does Fabric mean for the Power BI data analyst, check out Manuel Quintana's video from just last month, where he talks about the Power BI developer of the future. Or if you want to see another example of this, check out my other session from uh, about six months ago, where we went through and did an end-to-end -end solution inside of Fabric as well. But I'll call this one my Learn with the Nerds data engineering workspace. If I expand my advanced options, you might be able to see some of the different license modes that are available to you for types of different workspaces you can create. The one that we want to make sure that we have available to us is this truck trial license mode there. So I want to make sure that is enabled. If you don't see that though, you can also go through and potentially enable your free trial inside of your Microsoft environment. But again, that might be restricted based on your organization. Now I'm going to go through again, uh, I exit out of that. So I'm going to call it my Learn with the Nerds Data Engineering. I'm going to make sure I have my license mode of trial enabled for myself. And I'm going to go ahead and create my fabric enabled workspace. Now you'll know this is a fabric enabled workspace because it has the nice little diamond symbol right there where we're shining like a diamond here inside of fabric today. Now what I want to do is I want to go through and provision a lake house. Now, again, there are a couple of different options for how you can go through and store and access your data inside of Fabric. Ultimately, it's all going to be stored on the one lake, the data lake that's managed by Microsoft in your Fabric environment. But we're going to be going with the lake house for ourselves now. So what I want to do is because I'm in the data engineering persona here at the bottom of my screen, when I click on the new option, it gives me a drop down list of different related topics to data engineering. So things like a data pipe a data flow, an environment, an experiment, if I wanted to go through and do some sort of data science. But about halfway down, we see this option for a lake house that's enabled for us. So by going and selecting a new lake house, it's going to allow me to give this an option. And the data set that we're going to be working with today is a Microsoft provided sample data set called the Worldwide Importers Data. So I'm going to go through and call this my Worldwide Importers Lake House. And it kind of goes along with what we're doing, right? This is our organization organizational lake house. This is where all of my tables are going to be stored that my data analysts can go through and access in Power BI or with SQL or with Spark notebooks. So now when we go through and click on the create new lake house option, we're going to be provisioning this lake house. And this will take just a few moments for us to kind of go through and have access to everything. Do we have any questions over in the chat that might be uh, helpful to answer at this time? Let's see if we got any questions. Uh, don't see Power BI icon. Yeah, some of the limitations will be uh, removed. Again, depending on what you can do inside of your Fabric environment, uh, you can go through and see things uh, or not. Is One Lake just a Microsoft name for their lake house? It's really their name for their managed data lake. So inside of your Microsoft Fabric environment, you are provisioned with a storage account, which is going to have a, its own separate billing apart from your Microsoft licensing. So if you want to go through and you want to store data in the data lake house, 
house, you can do that. And ultimately all of that data will be stored in the Microsoft One Link, which is again, just a storage account, just a place where you can go through and access data. Okay, we got a nice little error message there. Let me see if I can go through and refresh my screen. It might've already been provisioned and just didn't give me a nice option. Nothing here yet. Okay, let's go through and try and do one other lake house name. Maybe it's a, a name that's already taken by another one inside of my environment. So I'll call this Worldwide Importers ALL with my three digit initial at the end there. Hey, that one's taken. So what we saw there probably wasn't a reason. Uh, the reason behind that was I already have a lake house somewhere else called Worldwide Importers, and it didn't allow me to overwrite that. We're essentially creating a container inside of my storage account or a folder inside of my storage account. And just like your four folders on your file uh, explorer in your on-premises file explorer, you can't have multiple folders with the same name or multiple items with the same name. So probably what I was experiencing there. Apologies for that. Now we're inside of my lake house though. I was able to create that. We're able to, we're good to go now. No, uh, no major delays there. What I wanna do next is be able to go through and access data. Now, as an organization, you probably already have data that exists somewhere inside of either the cloud or on premises. Now you could say, okay, well, I need to move all of that data now over inside of the one lake house. And that's what you're telling me. No, you do not. So what Microsoft has done is be able to integrate your other door data storage solutions inside of your fabric lake house with something known as a shortcut. And shortcuts are going to be a data engineer's best friend inside of Microsoft Fabric. Shortcuts are going to allow in Microsoft One Lake a unify your data across domains, across clouds and accounts by creating a single virtual data lake, meaning it's not technically one data lake, but it acts like one for your entire enterprise. So experience and analytical engines can directly connect to existing data sources, whether it's in Azure, whether it's in Amazon, whether it's in One Lake, or we are introducing some new ones over time that are going to be coming in the next few months. So if you want to follow along with this where you can go through to add in a shortcut is going to be inside of your lake house explorer if you go to your list of files here and click the ellipsis you can create a new shortcut so you can go through and access files that exist in another data lake now the reason i wanted to make sure that you went through and downloaded those class files is inside of that is going to be a text document for how you can go through and gain access to a publicly available pragmatic works data lake where i have some sample data that you can work with to follow along with this demonstration so go ahead and select the new shortcut option currently the sources of data that you can connect with are a little bit limited but they're going to be expanding the reach as we continue to work and you continue to go through fabric so where we're going to be going through and pointing to is an Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. This is going to be a data lake that would be provisioned inside of Azure that your organization would own and that you could be given permission to based on your role within the company. So I'm going to go through and select the Azure Data Lake Storage connector. It's going to bring up this menu that's going to ask for some information. Who are you? How do you know that you can connect to this, right? Security is still important as we go through and start working inside of Fabric. So what I'm going to paste in here, and you should find in that text document, is a URL. My URL, my endpoint to the place, uh, my location of where the data exists inside of one of those Microsoft data centers across the world. So we're going to place the URL for that there, PWADLS Fabric is the name of that data lake. And then we're going to go and see how we can authenticate. Now, most of you do not work for Pragmatic Works. So the method that we're going to be using for authentication is not your organizational account. It's going to be going through and using a SAS or a shared access signature. And that SAS token should be available for you in the document as well. And you can go through, you can paste that in there. It's a long just string of like random numbers and letters and dates and stuff like that. But ultimately, by going through and saying that you want to use that token, you should be able to click next and then go through and make that connection to the Pragmatic Works Data Lake. Now we've gone through, if you got to that point and you're able to go and access this right now, you see this kind of menu on my screen I'm seeing where the shortcut name and the sub path is there, you've, you're in, you're accessed, you're gonna go through and be able to follow along with this. If you don't, you might have to like disconnect from a VPN, there might be some other security issues as we're going along. We can work through that as we go, or maybe email me after the class and I can help you out if you wanna follow along. Now what I'm gonna name this shortcut is my just external data 
lake. I know this could probably be given a little bit better name, but just to kind of reinforce what we're doing, this is a data lake that is an external to my fabric environment, but it's going to be integrated into the one lake environment. The target location you cannot change. For the sub path, I would have you go through and put a forward slash and then use the word worldwide. If you don't, that's okay, but we're gonna be connecting directly to a folder inside of that data lake that allows you to go through and access five or six or so different files. So back, uh, forward slash worldwide, and then go ahead and say you wish to create this. Now, once you do that, you should be able to see in your Explorer, which is kind of like the file Explorer, kind of like uh, your uh, object Explorer inside of Management Studio, you're going to see this file with shortcut, see the link here, it's going to be able to click on that and then go through and see files that are coming from the Pragmatic Works data lake. And now we can go through and start to work with these files and integrate them into other aspects of our organization. That's great. Now, what I wanna do is kind of start focusing on something called a data pipeline. This is my raw layer of data. This is my data that I've got for my organization, but we wanna go and we wanna actually store that in a lake house so that my analysts downstream have an ability to go and connect with that either in a Power BI data set or by using it in like a SQL database type of structure. So where I'm gonna go is back to my workspace over here. I'm gonna go and select the workspace that I have currently open, learn with the nerd data engineering. Now, you will notice that there are a couple of items here that were created as a part of this lake house. There's going to be the lake house itself, this option right here, and then a couple of like linked items. And those are going to be what we are going to use to be able to allow for connection to my lake house tables I create that are stored on the data lake, but are accessed via SQL operations. So we can go and actually use a SQL analytics endpoint or a semantic model. Both of those are used heavily inside of our other Learn with the Nerds on Fabric. So if you want to know more about them, check them out. Now, what I'm going to do inside of my workspace is again, because I'm in the data engineering persona, I have the ability to go and choose a new data pipeline. And I want to go through and kind of give you an overview of what is the data pipeline experience and what even is data factory, which is where a lot of this technology comes from. So I'm going to first click on new data pipeline, but I want to give you some kind of background to what this is. So before this goes too far, let's talk a little bit more about data factory. So data pipelines are going to enable powerful workflow capabilities at cloud scale. So with data pipelines, you can build complex workflows that can refresh your data flows inside of uh, Fabric. It can go through and move petabyte sized data. You can go through and define sophisticated control pipelines, and you can ultimately use them to build complex ETL and data factory workflows that can perform different tasks at scale. There's different control flow capabilities that are built into data pipelines to allow you to build workflow logic that provides loops, conditionals, so kind of a similar concept to if you've ever worked in SQL Server integration services, some of the stuff we could do with that. Now, we're going to be focusing primarily on something called the copy data activity, which is going to allow you to take data from a source and load it to a destination. I have data in my data lake. I want to load it to my lake house. Even though it's integrated together, there might be some things we want to go through and make sure are set up well or transformed or set up to, with columns that we want or maybe don't want. So this can be a tool we use to do that. Now, with a data factory pipeline, there's going to be different connectors. And there are many connectors, probably about 100 or so, but there's going to be different operations you can do depending on this connector that you are working with. For example, I can go through and I can do a lot with my data warehouse, including using like a lookup activity or a get metadata activity or authoring some sort of SQL script, whether it be a hard-coded written out SQL script or one that is a part of a stored procedure because it's more of a SQL operation. With Dataverse, I don't really have that capability. You can take data from Dataverse, you can write data to Dataverse, but you really can't query it with SQL like you can a data warehouse, at least easily inside of this tool as of right now. Maybe that'll change in the future. So some pretty cool different data connectors we can work with. Now, ultimately what we're gonna walk through to begin with is this data factory pipeline copy assistant, which is going to provide you almost like a wizard-like experience, not like wizard-like cool, although it is pretty cool, but a wizard where you can go through and walk through the steps of authoring your own data pipeline without having to actually understand all of the different orchestrations that's happening behind the scenes. You're just gonna say where you wanna take your data from, where you want to write it to. So let's go back over inside of Fabric and let's create our first data pipeline. 
Now, this is going to be a pipeline I use to point to my fact table to begin with. I wanna go, I wanna grab data from my fact file, essentially, inside of the uh, data lake that I have that shortcut created to. And then I wanna go through and I wanna move that into my lake house. So I'm just gonna call this one to begin with fact sales. It's gonna be the name of my pipeline in this workspace, and then I'm gonna create this. Now, whenever you go through and create a new pipeline, it's going to bring you into the Data Factory pipeline experience. And we'll dive into a little bit more conversation around this as we go along. But before I like uh, start getting to in the nitty gritty with some of this, I just wanna walk you through that assistant, the copy assistant, kind of walking you through the wizard-like experience. Because there's a lot here, it's kind of just a blank screen. What am I supposed to do, Austin? Let's walk through that step by step. Now, over inside of the home ribbon, you're going to see several different things. So uh, for as a part of this orchestration here, we have our toolbar and then we have kind of like our pipeline canvas. So this would be our canvas here and this would be our toolbar up here. Inside of the canvas, you can go through and use different activities to paint this awesome data ETL portrait. Again, think like a director. You are pulling data from here. You're pulling data from there. You're joining it together. You're transforming the data. You are going to be the author of this in this is your canvas to paint a beautiful data picture. So that's what we're going to be doing for ourselves as well. I'm going to go over here inside of the home ribbon to the copy data and choose them in this drop down option, the copy assistant. So from the copy data, choose the copy data assistant. And that's going to bring up that again wizard like experience to walk you through this process step by step. So to begin with, we need to choose a data source. Where are we getting our data from and how do we know that we can connect to it? So there are many different connections that you can go through and make. There's workspace ones that are going to be for your fabric workspace, Azure connections, database connections, NoSQL databases, lots of different ones there. Now, the one that we're going to choose is going to be the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. Now, if for some reason you can't find that very easily here, you can always go through and just search Gen 2 in the search bar right here, and that's going to bring up the only option for connecting to a data lake. So go through and choose that. That's our data source. That's the place we want to go through and access our data. We'll say next, and then we need to go through and define a connection. Now, because we went through and created that shortcut earlier, you should see here a connection to that inside of this user interface. We've essentially created something like a linked service, if you're familiar with traditional data factory, but you're not going to have that same functionality with linked services and data sets in Fabric. It's all just going to be wrapped up in the connection. So if I choose this connection here, it's going to already be able to authenticate. I can verify that by just clicking test connection and going through and making sure my connection is successful. And then once I've connected, I want to go through and pick what data am I actually going to work with there. So I'll choose the next option here and then go through and actually pick a data source. Now you'll see based on how I have my data lake set up, I have three different folders here. So the worldwide is what we really want to go through and access. And then specifically the fact sale.snappy parquet file. Parquet is just a data compressed file that's going to be able to be great on data lakes because it's going to minimize your storage footprint when compared with something like a traditional comma separated value file because it's columnar compressed instead of row compressed. So when I choose the fact sale parquet file, it can automatically detect that is a parquet format and I can get a nice pre view of what my data looks like. Now I can go through and say, this is what I want. This is awesome. I'm connecting to that data. What do I want to do? I want to go and actually get the data destination now. Where am I going to write this data to? I'm pulling it from my data lake. I want to put it in my lake house. So I'm going to choose from my available options here, my lake house connector. So my lake house workspace, we're going to choose the worldwide importers lake house. So I'll just choose that and say next. And then I have to decide if I want to either create a new lake house from right here or connect with my existing lake house. And because I already have one that exists, I'm going to choose the worldwide importers lake house for myself. And then that's all you have to do on this menu. Again, walking through this pretty easy so far. Nothing crazy. You're not writing any crazy code or anything like that to do this. And then just say next. Now here I do have an option. Where do I want to actually store this data? Do I want to store this as a table or as a file? I'm going to store this in my root folder called table. 
tables, which is going to be where I can have all of my database, data warehouse-like tables inside of my lake house. I'm going to create this to a new table because I don't have any tables yet, called just fact sale, happy with that. You do have an ability to come in here and change column mappings and data types and things like that potentially. We're not going to worry about any of that for this one, just want to get the basics down. So all we have to do for this is once we have the name there, say next at the bottom one more time, this is going to give us a final overview of what this is going to do. It's going to take data from the data lake and load it to the lake house. It's going to say from this connection here, it's going to load it to this connection over here. You do have an option here that says start data transfer immediately. We want that enabled. So we're going to go through and we're going to say save and run. That's going to kick off this data pipeline. That's going to go through, execute against that file, pull all the records from it on that external data lake and move it into my fabric environment now. Now, this is going to be the traditional kind of copy data experience that you're seeing now. And we're going to walk through that in just a moment here. But while this runs, let's go and let's have a little conversation about some of the different offerings that Pragmatic Works can give you if you want to go through and learn more about working inside of Data Factory. So I'm going to, number one, go over inside of a web browser, and I'm going to go to pragmaticworks.com. And if I go to pragmaticworks.com, and if you do this right now, you should see inside of this screen, a pop-up window that is going to introduce that Cert XP. It's going to give you the ability to go and sign up for the trial, for like the beta trial of this uh, technology that we're introducing. So if you go through and click learn more on that pop-up, it's going to allow you to join that wait list right there. Make sure you join the wait list. Get in here as fast as possible. If you haven't gone through and learned about uh, or taken the Power BI Data Analyst certification, we have courses on that already on the Pragmatic Works platform, but you can go through and gain help using that. Put your email in there, join the wait list, get on this so you can go through as quickly as possible and learn more as well as be able to get some nice certifications that can help you further your career. So we're going to have some awesome things like gaming, gamifying your learning journey. It's going to make this fun. It's going to make this an awesome experience. We got Mr. Percy here. Percy is the star of the Pragmatic Works platform. He is going to be our, your little uh, assistant as you're going through and working through this technology. Now we have that, but I also want to introduce you to the Pragmatic Works uh, on-demand learning management system. So I'm going to go through here and sign in really quickly. And if you've never seen this before, oh, I'm in an incognito browser. Let me choose a different browser here really quickly so I can go through and uh, quickly log in. So I'm going to go to Pragmatic Works again and sign in, and I'm going to show you some of the different courses that we have available to you if you're interested in learning more. Now, there are going to be some of these courses that are are completely free to you and we have a nice free trial subscription you can go through and sign up for and it should be down in the chat right now so go ahead if you don't have a subscription already you can get free access to a lot of our different videos on this channel we also have some paid uh, access videos as well so you can go through and decide what you want to do if you're interested in learning more about some of these technologies like introduction to data factory if you're like austin that pipeline was pretty cool what else can you do with that Take that Introduction to Data Factory course. It's going to blow your mind. It is so fun. Now, the other classes we have are some of the available ones down here. Hey, look at that good looking guy right there. That's going to be the Advanced Data Factory class. For once you've gone through and learned more about it, you can go through and see what else you can do with pipelines. Now, this is specifically going to be in the Data Factory that's not in Fabric, but all the uh, topics that you learn are going to have like a one-to-one -one scenario for working inside of Microsoft Fabric as well. You see Dashboard in a Day, if you've never taken that one before, definitely check that out also. It's a nice experience walkthrough of working inside of Power BI. Now, if you sign up for one of those free trial subscriptions and come over here to our categories, you can go to the free for life category and see all the free courses that are available to you. It's about 25, I guess, uh, looking at this. So a lot of our different Learn with the Nerd sessions are on here, as well as a lot of our in-a-day recorded sessions that we have available to you also. So check that out. Go through. Sign up if you haven't already. Get on that Cert XP wait list because, again, it's going to be a game changer for learning or just taking certifications as well. Sometimes it's good to go through and learn about Azure. Hey, Austin, what are you talking about data lakes and virtual networks? Go take my AZ900 Cert XP course, and you'll learn a lot more about that. All right, let's get back to the show. Now, this pipeline is still running, and it's going to run for a little bit here, but I can tell it's running by going through and clicking in the background of my pipeline canvas and going through here and looking at the output of this. I can see this is still in progress right now, and it's going to be for a few more minutes. 
While that's running, I want to walk you through a different experience of working with data factory pipelines. So I'm going to go back over to my workspace again, and I want to go through and create another pipeline that's going to be using the more traditional method that users might experience if they worked in data factory before. I want to go over to my new option and again, select data pipeline. And then I'm going to give this a name. Now, ultimately, what I want to walk through here is something called the child parent child design pattern. So I'm going to walk you through this. If you don't want to follow along with this part, you're just like, I just want to watch for this one, feel free. Or if you get behind at any point, just go back and watch this a little bit later on and you can rewatch it as many times as you need to. So I'm going to go in here and call this my child pipeline. I'm going to create this object inside of my fabric environment, which is a pipeline, right? It's going to be able to see the same thing as we saw before. But instead of going through this time and using the copy data data assistant, I'm just going to add a copy data activity to my canvas. Now, when I do this, my experience is going to be altered quite a little bit, uh, but we're going to have the activity that we're working on here. My canvas is still right here, but then you're going to go through and have to define all of those settings, not through that wizard like experience, but just by yourself based on what you want to do. So for this one here, I want to go through and I want to set up another copy data. I'm going to take from my source here. Where's my source? It's going to be right there. I'm going to use that same connection, the same connection you already have can be used over and over and over again. And then we're going to have to go through and figure out where our data lives. Now, what I'll point you to is this nice little browse icon right here. If I click that, that's going to open up a nice flyout graphical user interface place where I can go through and point to the files that I want to use. So I'm going to go over here and choose my worldwide root folder. And this time I'm going to go over to the dim city file. So we did the fact sale before we're going to our dimensional table, dimensional file. That's going to have our city based data. And once I select that, I'll say, okay, now by going through here and choosing this, this will automatically fill out my file path or the location of where my file lives inside of that external data lake. I will change my file format from the binary to the parquet just to make sure I have an ability to access this file efficiently. And then what I can do with this is I can preview my data by clicking the preview data button. It brings you a sample size of your data. You can go through and verify that everything looks right for extracting that data from the data lake. That's our source, just like we did before. It's just a little bit different configuration for how you go through and do it. For the destination here, we're going to go over to the data store type. We're going to use a workspace based data. You can also use external, meaning you can write data to, again, Dataverse or an Azure SQL database or many different sources and destinations of data. And then we're going to use the lake house for the workspace data type. And again, that worldwide importers. So the worldwide importers is going to give me an ability to go through, connect with that same lake house that I'm currently writing that fact sales file to. And then I just need to go through and decide my table table name. So for this one, I'm going to choose dim city. That's going to be the kind of similar name of the file I'm extracting. I'm going to use the same table name as well. I am going to expand one advanced option and choose the overwrite option here for a little bit later on. It'll make sense when we do that. So this is again, the same experience as the copy assistant, just using instead the traditional data factory experience. So let's go through ahead and run this one as well. In my home ribbon, I have an ability to go and choose the run option directly here. And that's going to go and actually execute this data pipeline to be able to take the data and write it to my lake house. When you run it, it's going to ask you to save it and run it. Choose save and run. This will run. This will take not quite as much time. Do we have any other questions right now as we've been going along? Any other questions that might be good to talk about? Uh, the cost of fabric is compared to Synapse. Uh, I'm going to give you the traditional, it depends, uh, unfortunately. So depending on your organization, you're going to have to purchase some sort of fabric license that's going to be enabled across your organization that gives you a specified amount of compute depending on the selection you make. That can vary in cost greatly depending on the size of your organization and what you want to do with your Fabric workspace. Now, when compared to Synapse, where we have like a dedicated SQL pool or something like serverless SQL on demand, it can vary greatly. So you'd have to probably get with someone on that. But in general, Fabric is going to have a capacity license, either a F SKU or a P SKU that you would need to purchase. So if you do have premium per capacity, that also gets you the ability to work with Fabric enabled items. All right, this has gone through and run successfully. Copy data succeeded, took about 23 seconds. So not long at all for that one. That other one's still running, I think, in the background. Let's go over to our lake house and let's see if we can actually view this for a moment here. 
So as we go through, we'll see it's in, on the identify right now. This will ultimately kind of map over there in a second. But we have this dim city and we have this fact sale table that's going to be stored in the lake house. So let's see if I refresh this, if it'll uh, go through and load there. Yeah. So by clicking the refresh button up here, it goes through and I can see my dim city table in my fact sale table as well. If I expand my dim city table, I will see all the columns, all the data types inside of that. So that was already written for us in the background using that data pipeline, done everything for you. You don't have to know SQL. You don't have to know Python. You can just use this graphical user interface and you'd be able to do a lot of functionality inside of Fabric. Here's my data. Here's a nice view of it. From here, technically, I could go through and query this data as well with uh, T-SQL operations. We're not going to do that for this one, but if you want to know more about that, again, check out some of those other previous Learn with the Nerd sessions. Now, we have our table here, but that's one table, right? And I have like five tables. What happens if you have 100 tables, right? Are you going to go through and you're going to create pipelines for every single table and file inside of that? That's going to be hard to manage, hard to monitor. Let's look at a way that we can go through and really dynamically use pipelines to create a metadata-driven pipeline so that we can extract some information about our data and use it alongside of our pipeline orchestration. So I'm going to go back over to my Learn with the Nerds workspace one more time and create one more data pipeline. Now, before I do that, I will have to come back in here and edit my child pipeline as well before I can actually use it because I'm going to kind of use this like uh, hierarchical pipeline structure as you want to think of it. So let's actually first go over to the child pipeline. Let's edit a couple settings about that. So what we're going to do with this is enable something called a parameter. Now, parameters are not a new conversation inside of the Power BI and Microsoft ecosystem, right? You have parameters that you might use in paginated reports or potentially a parameter that you could use in like an interactive report as well. But you have an ability to work with parameters on pipelines also. So I'm going to go by clicking one time inside of my pipeline canvas inside of this gray area right here, pull up my pipeline level settings and add in a parameter to the pipeline. I'm going to create a parameter and I'm going to give it the name of file name. So that's going to be the name of the parameter. And then I can also give it a default value if I want to, a value that's available by default. I'll just call this one placeholder. Notice it is a string data type. That's going to be perfect for what we're doing here. Now, with this parameter, what I'm going to do is go back inside of my copy data activity by clicking on it one time. You'll know it is selected because it turns that nice shade of green, fabric green, fabric green here. And then we're going to go through and we're going to map that parameter to my source and my destination inside of this copy data activity. So I'm going to go back over to my source settings for the copy data activity. And instead of using this hard coded file path, I want to go through and I want to click one single time inside of this box and I'm going to go and add some dynamic content to this. So what this is going to allow you to do is point to that parameter and be able to accept different kinds of values. Maybe you get a name called Dim City for your uh, file name. Maybe it's Dim sa uh, Fact Sales. Maybe it's Dim Product. Maybe it's Dim Person, Dim Customer, whatever it might be. You want to go through and be able to point to different ones based on what this pipeline receives. So what I'm going to use here is this file name parameter inside of the pipeline expression builder, you might see this and be like, Austin, I, I work with Power Automate a lot. This looks a lot like the Power Automate language. And it is very, very similar. There might be some differences here and there, but it has a lot of uh, similar kind of use cases and functionalities that you can do for this. So like choosing from the pipeline expression builder, this default file name parameter here, I'm just going to go ahead and say, OK. And that's going to allow for some mapping of a file name I'm going to receive a little bit later on. Now, the other thing I need to do is go and also map on my destination. What is the table name that's going to be created called as well? So for this one, I'm going to choose the X option on my table name, Dim City, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to click on the add dynamic content by hovering over or clicking inside of this box as well. Does the same thing, launches the pipeline expression builder. Now you might be thinking, okay, let's use file name. That could work. That could work. The problem with that is if I choose just file name, think of how my kind of file names are structured. Dim city uh, dot snappy dot parquet. That's not really what I want. I don't want to say dot snappy dot parquet for my table name, right? That doesn't make sense. So we need to get rid of dot snappy dot parquet. How we're going to do that is by using a dynamic expression here, which I'll put in the chat as well if you just want to copy it out. So I'll put that in the chat. It should go in there. But it's going to be using the replace function inside of this. So I'm going to say at 
replace, I'm going to be able to expect three values. What do you want to replace? What's the object that you're going to be replacing? Then what do you want to replace? And then what do you want to replace it with? So what I'm going to choose here in this uh, replace parentheses is the file name parameter. I'm going to add in a comma after the file name parameter and say dot snappy dot parquet to get rid of that. I'm going to place one more comma after that because this function needs to replace it with something. And I'm just going to put my single ticks in there. Not a space, not anything. Literally, I just want to replace dot snappy dot parquet with nothing. So it's going to allow me to do that inside of this functionality with the expression builder. Kind of some cool stuff we can do with that, right? Once you say OK here, everything is going to be good to go for moving forward and using the parent child design pattern. But we got to go build our other parent pipeline first, which is going to allow for metadata driven styles of ETL. So one more time, let's go back over into and I'll actually let's save this. Let's do a best practice. Let's save this pipeline by clicking your normal save icon there. And once that's saved down, we'll go back over into the fabric workspace. Let's create that other pipeline. So again, one more time, let's go through here and click the new button. Let's choose data pipeline. And then we're going to go through and we're going to give this one the name. The other one was called child pipeline. You're guessing it, parent pipeline. So I'm just going to use parent pipeline as the pipeline name. Again, just identifying these objects so that if I'm working collaboratively with others inside of this workspace, they know what it is. I know what it is. Everyone's happy, right? So I'm going to go through and say create. Once I do this, it's going to create and give me that blank canvas again. This time, we're going to work with a few different activities, not just the copy data. Copy data is, of course, the star of the show, the star of our movie that we're putting on with this canvas here as the director, right? But we can use some other ones as well. We can have some like character actors to kind of help us alongside of this. Now, if you go over from your home ribbon to the activities ribbon, you're going to see the entire list of activities that you can work with inside of data factory pipelines inside of Fabric. Now, there's a lot of normal ones that are coming from data factory experience that you might have seen before. There's also some new ones like the Office 365 Outlook. Look for a YouTube video that on my work walking through that one in just a few weeks that should be coming out on our channel as well. If you're not subscribed, if you don't have notifications on, what are you doing? Get them on right now. Now, what I'm going to first build with this is the activities pane. I'm going to go through here and choose the get metadata. Now, this activity is an awesome one because it allows me to go through and return information about the names and the data types and all the different stuff about the files that are on my data lake. So by going and using a get metadata activity, I can select that. And you notice it doesn't say source. It doesn't say destination. It's a different activity. It has different purposes. So it's not going to be going in through and using copy data. It's going to have something else as its functionality. By going over to the settings here, I need to go in and I need to specify a connection. So I'm going to go through and choose the connection here. And then I'm going to choose, need to choose that file path again. Now for this one, we're not going to be going down all the way to a file name. We're just going to be looking at a folder in here. So go ahead and click the browse icon there and then choose the worldwide folder. Once you do that, don't click any of the file names there. Just use the worldwide folder and say, OK. So by doing that, it should populate just the file name right here in this first box that's going to be our container or like highest level of folders inside of our data lake. And then we're going to go through and add in what we call a field list. What are the different things I want to return about this folder? Well, what I specifically want to talk about is the child items argument. The child item argument is essentially saying, what are the files that exist inside of this folder? Or maybe they're nested folders in folders, but what are the items there? I want to return them. I want to use them as a part of my get metadata activity in the metadata driven pipeline. So by selecting that and then going back to my home ribbon, I want to go through and I just want to test this out. Let's just see if this works. Let's see what we get out of this, right? So I'm going to choose the run option here, save and run. Go ahead and save and run this. This one won't take but a few seconds here once it makes the connection and actually executes because it's not moving any data. It's not going through and it's not uh, taking records or doing anything. It's just literally going through and gaining some information about our data on our data lake. So you can see this has already succeeded. If we have that output here, you should see a succeeds option. And then once we have succeeded, 
what we can do with this is we can actually look at the output of this. Now, again, I mentioned Power Automate earlier. If you have some functionality working in Logic Apps or Power Automate, it has a similar workflow. We're going to have activities that give us things and we want to use downstream in future activities. So I can actually look at the output of my Get Metadata here and I can see there's that list of items. Hey, I want to use those items to be able to work and do a copy data activity as well. So you can go through and leverage them inside of this architecture. Now, I'll pull this back up for a second here. There's one thing I want to get rid of, though. You know what? This fact sale, I'll tell you, it takes like 10, 15, 20 minutes sometimes to run. I already have it going, so I don't want to run that one right now. I want to actually go through and filter out that activity. So what I could do is go back over to my activities ribbon here and choose the filter activity. Now, over here on the far side of this, you may not see all of these depending on how big your screen is, but over on the far side of these different activities here, there's a nice little dot 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 or an ellipsis that we can go through and we can click to see some other activities that just don't show up on our pane there and we can use to pull in the filter activity this is going to allow us to filter the results from that child pipeline from that child items of that get metadata so i can go through and get rid of fact sale now a part of this that we need to also talk about is how we can go through and logically go from one pipeline activity to another it's going to be using this green little check mark that you might have already seen a couple times here but that's going to be creating something called a dependency or i like to call it sometimes a precedent constraint that allows me to pass values from one activity to another and also tell data factory the way i want these activities to go through and actually uh, run step one step two step three so what i'm going to do is use Use this green check mark by clicking one time on it with my mouse key i'm going to drag an arrow over to filter and just by simply touching that filter there it's going to make that dependency and make that connection from one to another so now only after the get metadata activity runs is the filter activity then going to go through and going to execute after that now the filter activity again has its own list of unique things that it can do so by going to the settings of the filter activity i can go and choose the items that i want to filter and the condition on which i want to filter them out let's talk about the items first so i'm going to go through here click on this box and this is going to be where you kind of have to start learning a little bit more about that pipeline expression builder. So if you're like, Austin, I want to create this, something similar in my environment. Don't really know how to simulate what you did here with what I'm doing. Again, go check out some of our courses on our on-demand learning platform because they have a long, long reach of how you can go through and do this exact thing in Intro to Data Factory or Advanced Data Factory or Intro to Synapse Analytics. This is kind of technology that's existed before. It's just being integrated into Fabric now. So choose the dynamic content item here, and we need to go through and pick which of these items we want to actually filter out. Now, Microsoft did us a solid here and gave us a really easy way to be able to point and choose what is the item that we want to work with. So by going three items down for me, it shows me to get metadata one child items. So I'm going to select the child items here, and it's going to give me this uh, little language for the activity get metadata one. I want to take that output, that output we looked at earlier with all that list of file names, child items, and I want to use that as my item that I want to filter. So that gives us the exact entire code we need there to be able to point to that. All you got to do for this one is say, OK, that was easy. Not too hard at all so far, right? Now, the condition might be a little bit uh, more kind of uh, nitty gritty on how you go through and get to this, but I'll give you the code for it here. I'm going to go over to my condition. I'm going to click in this box and add dynamic content for this as well. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the item that we want to filter out, and then we're going to be determining what is the filter going to be. So what I'm going to write here is I need to write out my expression for getting rid of the name fact. So I'm going to use not at not. It does not it does not contains, contains is the function that says it contains this value. And then I'm gonna put in another parenthesis here and inside of the contains parenthesis, I'm going to point to this filter item. Now that's gonna give me an item, oh, another parenthesis. So we have a lot of parentheses here, right? So what I'm gonna do with this is say, after item ending parenthesis dot name, again, I wanna go through to the name property, all of those names of the child items, the fax sales, the dim city, I wanna filter that. And then I'm gonna go through and say, what do I want to get rid of? I do not want this contain, a comma after this, and then the word fact. 
If it contains the word fact, it's not good to me. I don't want to work with it. And I'll put that code in the chat as well if you're looking to follow along. So there we are. There's our expression. There's how we're going to get rid of fact. So let's go ahead and say OK, because, oops, I might have messed this up somewhere. So let me close out my other parenthesis there. I think that might be it contains. Let's see if we do it one more time. Oops. Well, uh, luckily for me, I messed this up somewhere. Things happen. And I have another example. Let me go and paste this one in the chat now. Don't know quite where I missed that. I probably missed a parenthesis somewhere. Roast me in the chat. Feel free. But I just put the right one in the chat for you there now. So now we're going to go through, say, OK, green means good. Red means bad, just like normal. So we got green items here. We're happy. We're good to go. So what I want to do now is run this one more time. I just want to test this again. See what happens for this time when I want to go through and execute it. I'm going to choose run, save and run. There is a run ribbon here where you can go through and view different run histories and also be able to schedule this out if you want this to run on a weekly or daily or hourly occurrence potentially. So we're going to go through. We're going to use that get metadata activity. We're then going to pass the values from the get metadata into the filter. And then from that filter, we can look at the output as well. So filter one here, the output of that. I looked over six items, but I only brought back five. And what you will not see in this list of values here is the fact information table or file. So we've gone through, we filtered this out. Pretty cool. Now we're still not done yet. How do we actually go through and how do we get the data into the lake house? That's the whole point of this, right? We need to go and add in one, technically two more activities, but let's talk about each of them. We're going to add in one from our activities ribbon called the for each activity. So just as we did before, we're going to have to go in and we're going to have to use from that output of the filter, the items that we want to actually work on, the actual ones that we want to do something with. So I'm going to take from the filter, I'm going to use that green check mark and say when this runs successfully, pass those values into the for each. Now the for each isn't a loop. A lot of people say, oh, it's a loop. No, it's not. It's an iterator, meaning it's going to receive five items in this case, and it's going to iterate over each one. And for one, two, three, four, five, it's going to perform the same actions, but there's going to be different uh, values that are getting passed into that. So it's going to be dim city this time. It's going to be dim product. All these different things are going to be passed into the for each, and then we're going to have our worker pipeline that runs as well, that child pipeline. So for the for each activity, there is something I need to do with this also. I need to go in. I'll kind of move this over just a little bit so it's maybe easier to read. By clicking on the for each here, I have to determine what is the item that I want to go through and I want to iterate over. And this is going to be a little bit tricky, but I'll talk you through it on this one. So by opening that dynamic content expression builder, we're going to go and we're going to use the filter activity output. Now for this one, we're not going to have a nice item you can point to in uh, Microsoft, like didn't give us this exact thing because technically this can point to a lot of things, but we're going to type out dot value. We want to go and from that filter output, there is going to be a value array, which means a list of items. And we want to go and we want to access that array so that we know what to go through and iterate over. So the value here is what we want to go through and point to. I will copy this out and put it in the chat also for everyone and then say, OK, that's going to be what we're working on, the items that we want to go through and pass to our child pipeline. Now for the child pipeline, how we're going to go through and determine how it works is we're going to have to go inside of the for each. I told you I like movies. My favorite movie all time is Interstellar, but a movie you might have seen before is Inception. We're going to go two layers deep into this pipeline, dreams within dreams within dreams, pipeline activity canvases within pipeline activity canvases within pipeline activity canvases. Now, technically, you can only go one layer deep with this here. But by going to the for each activity, I'm going to click on this pencil icon here. And it's actually going to take me inside of the for each activity canvas, where I can go through and have a nested set of activities that need to run. And I get to determine what work needs to be done for each of those file names that get passed into the activity.
So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to go through and I'm going to use the invoke pipeline activity. This might be one again that you have to go through to the ellipsis to be able to see, but the invoke pipeline activity is going to be that one right there. I'm going to go through and call upon my child pipeline from my parent pipeline to be able to go through, iterate over all those files, pass that into the child. It's going to go for each of those different names. It's going to take the file and it's going to load it to my lake house table. This can happen against two against 200 different files to tables should you need it to. Now, what we have to do for this one is only really one thing. What is the pipeline we want to invoke? We're going to go through and we're going to invoke the child pipeline. This would give you a list of all of the ones available, but we have the child pipeline set up. It has a parameterized value inside of it, which we need to go through and determine for this. So we have to go through and use what are we going to actually be passing in to that child pipeline. So by clicking in this value box here, we go, we click on the dynamic content again, we go and we choose the first option here for each item. So it gives us that item parenthesis. And then we're just going to say here dot name. So item parenthesis, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, dot name. That's the value that we're going to be feeding into this. From that for each list of items that we're iterating, we want the name to iterate over. All right, say okay here. Let's go back up to our main canvas. Let's get out of the dream within a dream. Let's go to the main canvas here by selecting this option right there. And let's go ahead, do the best practice, save this thing down, make sure you save it. And then let's run this thing and see if all of our hard work paid off. So by going and choosing the run option here, this is going to go through. It's going to get the metadata out of the data lake. It's going to filter the metadata and get rid of the fact table. We don't want to get the fact table again. And then it's going to go through, pass all of those values into the for each activity. And when that runs, it's going to go through. And for every single one of those five files, going to go through and invoke a pipeline for each one that's going to go and copy it to the lake house. This is awesome. The functionality, the ability to do this, the ability to create metadata driven pipelines is something that we focus on in many of our different day, uh, boot camps that Pragmatic Works teaches because we want people to be able to dynamically point to this. This is way easier to monitor, manage. Once you set it up, it's pretty much good to go. It does all the work for you every single day. So if you're interested in learning more about Data Factory itself or Fabric, check out some of our bootcamp offerings that we have available. We got stuff filling up for Fabric boot camps a couple months down the line already. So if you're interested, sign up right now. Now we've gone through, we've run this, everything succeeded here. We're super happy that this ran. Let's go back over to our lake house and let's see if everything worked out fine. So we have here, it's going to do a refresh. You might have to again, go in and click the refresh button up here back on the lake house. Uh, but over in the lake house now, all of our tables, every single dimensional table, all of our, uh, everything from the data lake that we brought over into the lake house is there. So we've just taken all these data lake files, whether they're CSV or Parquet or whatever they are, we've now integrated them into a lake house that acts like a data warehouse. There is a data warehouse in Fabric. It's a little bit different structure, but there is a lake house here that we can go through. I could give this now downstream to my Power BI analyst. I could give this to SQL uh, analyst to be able to go through and gain business intelligence insights into this data. We can all connect to it together. We have a single source of truth. I love this functionality. Now, uh, we've done a lot here. So let me see if there are any questions before we kind of start diving into some of our next options here. Yeah, Phil Hirsch, um, one of the things I did earlier that might not have worked for you, I should have said it again, so I apologize. On my child pipeline, I did have to go through and make sure I enabled this advanced option here to overwrite. If that failed for you, if you failed all along and that dim city failed, that's the reason why. I like to give reasons why things fail. Failures and uh, pipeline things not executing correctly can be very helpful sometimes because you can actually go through and understand why something happened or why this functionality is not allowed. So make sure for your table action of the child, you have that overwrite set. That was specifically because we were just already, we already had that. I didn't want to have another filter that I filtered out. Could have done that technically, but trying to make this as simple to follow along with as possible.
Other questions that we have here, let's see if we got any. Can tables be created lake house accessible by Databricks? Yeah, so all of the different uh, lake house um, files essentially or tables that you have there can be accessible in external tools. I can go and actually log into Management Studio and I can go through and query my lake house. I can log into uh, the Power BI Report Builder tool and I can access my lake house via that method as well. If you go to your lake house, uh, ellipsis on the worldwide importers there and look at the settings. What you'll find over inside of one of the settings is this SQL analytics endpoint. This is your logical SQL endpoint that you can go through and leverage in external tools to be able to make connections. So you can see mine there. If you want to go and connect with it, that's fine. There's nothing here too private for us as we go along. Uh, let's see, any other questions? I got some starred ones here. I can't actually see them. Um, you're a wizard. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Well, I want to talk about one other thing. We went through and we went and uh, ran a pipeline from that copy assistant. And I told you it's going to take some time for that to run. Let's go actually see how long it took to run here. So I'm going to go back over in my list of items I have currently open to my fax sales pipeline. And let's see exactly how long this took to run. 10 minutes and 36 seconds. You're saying, what? some of those ran in like no time at all. What's happening? Why is this taking so long? Let me tell you why, but let me show you a different method for how we can understand why there's a lot of stuff going on with this. What we're going to use to be able to better understand what this file is, is something called a Spark Notebook. Part of the data engineering, again, persona inside of Fabric assumes that you want to work with a large amount of data potentially, or you want to be able to get your data integrated very quickly inside of your lake house or wherever you're going to be sending it to. So one of the abilities you have inside of Fabric is to not only work with data factory pipelines, but to work with something like a Databricks type notebook inside of this environment as well. Whenever you provision a Fabric workspace, you get Fabric Compute. Part of that compute enables you to work with Spark, Apache Spark. Now, if you've never worked with Spark before, I'll give you a little overview of it. It's essentially this open source distributed computing system. You got all of these different clusters of computers that are great for big data processing and analytics. You want to go through, you want to have this uh, various programming languages you want to work with, whether it's SQL or Python or R or Scala, you can use all of those in a Spark notebook inside of Fabric. Now, Data Factory pipelines, you know, great for graphical user interface, great for introduction to some of this, but they can work a little bit slowly. In a nutshell, Apache Spark is more focused on the co distributed computing, these c clusters of computers where they go through and they can work across vast amounts of data, but do so very quickly. So I'm going to go over to my data engineering workspace and I want to create a new uh, notebook here. So down about uh, over halfway of this one, create a new notebook for yourself in this workspace. Now we're going to go through and we're going to be able to connect to all of those different lake house tables, as well as all the different shortcut files by basically attaching a lake house to this workspace or to this notebook, excuse me. So I want to go through and choose the add option here, and I'm going to add in an existing lake house by clicking the add button. Now, this is going to open up for me my One Lake Data Hub. And this is where really uh, you start to see maybe the, the benefits of working in Fabric. I can go through and I can look at data across my entire organization should I need to. So I can go through and look at uh, lake houses in other environments or warehouses in other environments uh, in, in mine. I can be given access to just go and connect with the data. I may not be given access to the actual Power BI workspace, but hey, I need to work with that data and build a Power Power BI uh, visualization or report or you create some sort of dashboard ultimately, you can just be given access to the endpoint essentially and then go through to your one lake data hub and connect to it without ever actually interacting with the lake house itself. You just go to go through and build Power BI reports using that. So I'm going to go through to your and choose my worldwide importers lake house and add this to the notebook. Now, this is going to provide me, again, with kind of like that object explorer experience from SQL Server Management Studio, where I have a list of tables here and a list of files as well. Now, by choosing my external data lake files uh, shortcut, I can go through and see all of these different files here. And again, the one we extracted for this was the factsale.snappy.parquet file. So I want to go and just drag and drop this into my notebook user interface 
and it's actually going to use code language, PySpark, Python for Spark, to be able to create this connection for me. You don't have to be a Python expert. Now, can knowing Python help? Of course, absolutely. I'm not a Python expert, but I can go through and use some of this functionality to use this technology and be able to go through and gain access to some of this awesome compute power. So by going through and just simply dragging and dropping it here, it's going to create something called a data frame. A data frame is going to be something like a stored table. It's not really a table. It's like this a way we can store our data inside of a Spark cluster, that cluster of computers that's running. And then we can go through and actually work and use it. So by um, dragging and dropping that here, it creates the connection for me. It's going and using spark.read.parquet to go to my files folder, go to my external data lake folder, kind of go to that file location and then go through and actually build a way that I can connect with it. By doing that, I can click the run cell, which is at first going to send a request to Microsoft saying, hey, Austin wants to go through and provision a Spark cluster. This will go through and turn on pretty quickly for us. It will make that connection. It will give us that uh, ability to leverage Spark. And then it's going to actually pull back our data very, very quickly for us as well. Now, once we've gone through and made our connection, we'll be able to maybe understand a little bit more about it. This is going to be another integral part of really being a data engineer in Fabric, learning to work with Python, potentially just using SQL as well. I'll show you that you don't actually need to know Python at all. You can do SQL. If you know that, you're able to work with this same type of compute here. Now, let's see if there's any other questions. Can we load the data back to Azure SQL database after doing some transformations? Um, sure, absolutely. If you wanted to, uh, you can do that 100% uh, if you're looking to, to orchestrate something like that. You can take data from one location as long as you have an ability to connect with it from uh, from this lake house, uh, from this notebook here. You can actually go through and do that. The notebook's taking a little bit long to fire up right now, so we'll keep going on a couple other ones. Uh, are the tables delta tables? Great question here. Yeah, some way to talk about kind of gets into a little nitty gritty here. But yeah, this actual triangle icon here does mean that these are delta tables. So if I go through here and actually uh, were to go to my lake house, I would actually be able to see the underlying files and that there is a delta folder, which is going to store all the version changes of my data, as well as the data alongside of that. Um, are you, I saw another question here. Can we implement role level security on the lake house? Yes, I talk about that in my fabric boot camp where I go through and show you how that is enabled. Now it's not as easy to do as you might think. There's a couple of different things you would need to go through and kind of work with to, to be able to kind of implement that. But maybe I'll have a YouTube video on it in the future. It would take way too long to explain today. Microsoft does have some nice documentation for that though, if you're interested in working with that. Let me see here. Do we, I'm just going back in a couple more. This is taken, uh, that session started a little bit slower today. Do we strictly need a Lake House Azure SQL database setup? Um, no, uh, that, that's not a requirement. Uh, you can load data from an on-premises database using things like uh, data flows to connect to on-premises data. There's still a little bit of uh, functionality where you can't quite work with uh, on-premises data in uh, Data Factory right now, but it should be coming hopefully in quarter one of 2024, according to Microsoft. All right, back over here. Let's go and let's look at this. So this took a little bit longer to start up than I thought, but once the Apache Spark cluster started up, which took about two minutes and nine seconds, I was able to go through and connect with all of my data right there in about six, seven seconds or so. So this brought me back just a sample size of the data that I can go through and look at. Let me go through and scroll down just a little bit. And I want to go and kind of hover somewhere over this. It's about right here beneath this. I want to add in another code cell. So a notebook is going to contain really three things. It's going to either contain markdown cells for you to have kind of like commented out code, or it's going to contain live code cells or also potentially visualizations that you can go through and author by connecting to different libraries of code packages and things like um, matplotlib or seaborn or some of those different libraries that are very popular when working with Spark. Now, what I want to do now is I have a data frame. That data frame exists in memory inside of my Spark cluster. So by going through and referencing whatever I call this data frame variable for, which is just df that was created for me by default, I can say df dot count and then just put the open and close parentheses. Let's see how many records we were actually executing against. 
So we go through here, we run this and we see, whoa, that's a lot. This is 50 million records. And that's kind of why that pipeline took a little bit longer to run. 50 million records takes a little bit of time to be able to go through and store from one location to another. So what if we could potentially speed that process up? What if we could go through and use this technology to be able to also go in and write the, the, the same the type of a file from the data lake into my lake house, but just see how fast Spark could handle it. That's what we're going to do. So I want to go through, add in another code cell. I'm going to create something called a variable. That's just going to be something that I get to determine. It's going to be called my table name variable. So how this works is you would go through and define what you want the variable name to be, table underscore name, and then what do you want it to equal? This variable that I'm going to use is e going to equal, uh, not in, in double quotes, you can use single quotes as well, single ticks, but I'm going to choose WWI, Worldwide Importers, Sales. Just give it a slightly different name. Technically, we're doing two copies of the same data, but it's just a demo anyway, right? So we're going to go through, we're going to choose table name, WWI Sales. We're going to run that, and then we're going to be able to use that variable now later downstream in our notebook here. So I'm going to add in one more code cell, and by doing that, I'm going to type in something this time. If you want to type it, fine. If you don't want to just have me paste it in the chat here in a moment, you can do that as well. I'm going to say for my data frame, I want to write that data frame. Now, this is the data that is coming directly from my shortcut. That's where I created this data frame too. I want to write this in the mode, and I'll choose overwrite just to go through and make sure it doesn't have any issues. I'm going to choose format here, the format of Delta. And that's what our nice contributor earlier in the chat was talking about. What is Delta? Delta is essentially the property that ensures that in a lake house, you get the ability to work with acid type transactions, meaning that this is going to be reliable and you're not going to have a data swamp, which means you have just data stored everywhere. There's no governance. There's no uh, way to determine what's valid data and what's not data. We call that a data swamp versus an actual data lake. So Delta helps us achieve that. And then I'm going to choose to save this. I want to go through and save it to my tables backslash. That's so going to be in the tables of my lake house. And then I'm going to add alongside of that my table name variable. So that's going to be what I use to be able to write this again from my uh, my my data lake directly into my lake house. And then I'm going to kick this off and run this. Now, it's not going to run in like five seconds, but let's see just how much quicker this runs. I'll tell you, this back sales pipeline I've run at different times over the, the last couple of weeks and for different events. Uh, it's taken anywhere from 10 to 25 minutes sometimes to run. And that's going to depend on how much compute you actually have available to you. Again, depending on the type of license you select and when you're purchasing a fabric license you're going to get more compute available to you if you don't have a lot of compute it could take even longer if you have more compute obviously it's going to go quicker that's what you're really kind of purchasing when you purchase a fabric license um i'm still getting a couple more questions while this is running here uh to replace the process how about uh, some data operations can be integrated with snowflake yes so you can go through and connect with snowflake inside of your pipelines potentially uh there's also going to be uh i think ultimately maybe some way to have a shortcut that goes to snowflake now that's maybe something that might come in the future hopefully i like to see i want to see shortcuts everywhere i want to make it very very easy to connect to my data and again unify data across different cloud architectures and integrate them into one environment. So that would be awesome to see. Um, can we switch, create switch using on-prem server or uh, files? Yeah, you can go through and connect with on-premises. Again, there's some limitations to that. So I don't quite understand the question. Uh, can we create switch? But there is an ability to go through and use either an on-premises SQL database. And if you're trying to do something similar to what I did with my parent pipeline, create metadata driven, instead of using like a get uh, metadata activity, you could potentially use a lookup activity that allows you to go through and uh, run some sort of SQL operation, maybe against some sort of control table or against your system uh, tables to be able to see what data you want to go through and extract and actually work with. Accessing Azure Key Vault currently is not available. That is going to be one of the big things they're pushing for, I think, in quarter one, 2024 for Microsoft. 
So I know for security reasons why that is so important for individuals so that we're not potentially exposing our secret information or our access keys and things like that. Uh, so that will be coming, but currently is not available for us inside of Fabric. Azure Synapse migration from Fabric is possible as well. That is going to be something that you would probably need to use like a copy data activity or some sort of orchestration like this, depending on your scale of your data. If you have 100 or 600 million or a billion records inside of your Synapse data dedicated SQL pool, it could potentially take a long time to do that from a pipeline. So using Spark would work, but you do have an ability to connect and to load this to a lake house, similar to what I've already done so far in our course today. Uh, let's see if we have any from earlier and any more questions here as we go along. Can you bring the data into Spark Canvas using SQL? Absolutely. So one of the other things that uh, ultimately we'll do here in a moment when this finishes running, oh, it just did finish running. Okay, uh, well, I'll get back to that in just a moment here. So where did it take about 10 minutes before, 10 minutes to perform this operation? This went through this time and ran it in three minutes. So we've cut down our time to actually have this run by about uh, one third. Uh, so we've gone through and really sped up our process. Now, again, imagine you're executing against even more than 50 million records. Now, some individuals saying, Austin, I don't even have 50 million records, but we got people out here who are working with billions of records from time to time. So this is really an optimal tool for working with these big data scenarios because it really speeds up development time. Instead of having a pipeline running for hours, this can go through and potentially run it in minutes, right? So that's going to be the big use case for working with Spark. Now, someone asked about, hey, I don't really know Python, right? This is all working with PySpark. I don't understand this at all, Austin. You lost me here. Well, what if I told you, you can also go through and use SQL operations in this as well. Let's actually go through and do something with another code cell here called DF. So I'm gonna take my data frame and I wanna go through and do something called create or replace. I was hoping IntelliSense would pop up here. It might in a moment. Create or replace temp view. I wanna go through and create a temporary view that I can go through. I can store my data frame inside of so that I can access it from some of those other languages that are available inside of, of uh, Fabric Notebooks. So I'm going to create this. I'm going to call this my fact view. This is going to be the name of the view that I want to do. This is going to happen almost instantly. We're not really moving data. We're just having a different way to access that data. And then what I can do is another code cell down is say, I want to use SQL. So I'm going to use something called a magic command percent percent SQL. And for this code cell, even though that this notebook was primarily written in Python, PySpark, I can actually go through and just say, I want to select star from fact, and I want to then go through and run this and bring back results. I want to use SQL to be able to determine what's happening with this. There we go. That easy to start using SQL. You don't necessarily have to go and learn Python, although it will help you to be able to understand more and more of what you can do and really enhance your, uh, your abilities of what you can connect with. So that's select star, right? What if I wanted to do something else? And I, Austin, what if I want to go through and perform some other, some kind of aggregation? Well, again, you can do that as well here. And the awesome thing about that, if I use percent percent SQL and say something like, I want to select my city key and I want to do a sum of the unit price. Again, this is just SQL. And then I want to go through and say from fact, and I want to group by because we're doing an aggregation and we're uh, comparing that to my city key. I want to look at this now. This will also give us to return results for ourselves that have been aggregated that we can then go through and study inside of our Spark environment. The awesome thing about this again, and maybe this one doesn't lead itself to this exact example, great, but you can come in here and look at this as a table or as a chart. And I absolutely love this. I mean, the ability to do this and just go quickly visualize your data with SQL is awesome. So you can go through and look at this again, maybe not the best example of the chart I would use for this, but we can go through and better understand that as we continue along. All right. Um, I want to see if there's any other questions that we have for today. A gateway required to connect to data. No, a gateway is going to be specifically for on-premises data. Um, it was only showing a, yeah, so currently um, data lakes, and, uh, Azure SQL, this would be Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 uh, and Amazon S3 buckets are the only way you can go through and connect to external data. There's going to be more that are added. 
Uh, CICD best practices. We talk about that again in the Fabric Bootcamp. We talk about how do we then go through and talk about uh, some uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment or delivery, or your biology may vary on which one you want to choose for that. Integrating DevOps into Power BI. Again, conversations we have there. So definitely check that out. Now, as we start to wrap up this bootcamp, I number one want to say thank you. So uh, bootcamp, uh, this learn with the nerd session. Uh, as we start to wrap this up, I want to say thank you for attending. Uh, hopefully you have had an awesome time. Uh, I want to put a couple of links in the chat. Number one, my email address. If you want to talk to me about any of our offerings, send me an email address. Uh, send me an email. We can chat today about that. We can set up a meeting. Say, hey, Austin, I want to go through and sign up for a boot camp, or I'm interested in some of the other Pragmatic Works offerings. Check that out. I can help you out with that. If you're interested in connecting with me on LinkedIn, where I post a lot of fabric content and have YouTube content, I uh, kind of link to that. You can add me on LinkedIn as well. Always love to kind of go through and see who's been in some of our courses. And then as well, I want to make sure that you go through and have that free trial sign up so that you can go and get access to the Pragmatic Works library and see what's available for you there. So definitely check that out as you go along and see what you have the ability to do. Very fast. Yeah, we got to move pretty quick here, uh, Michelle. So sorry if it was too quick. Always remember, you can go back and watch this anytime. We only had an hour and a half to do this session. Would love to spend more and more time. Again, look for more videos in the future where we go through and talk about fabric. This is not going away anytime soon. So I again want to say thank you so much. Hopefully you had a great session. Watch this again if you need to kind of go back and look and review and see what's available to you. And let's see what other offerings we have here. We have coming up pretty soon the Excel Beginner to Pro Learn with the Nerd session. It's going to be taught by Allison in just about a month or so, January. That's our Learn with the Nerd session. So you're like, Austin, I, I want to work with Excel. This is, this is a little bit much for me. Go and check that out. We're going to have some awesome Excel content there. We're going to continue to have Excel content as we have a boot camp coming up for that as well. So thank you so much. Hopefully you all had a great day. I'll see you in the next one.